Nothing could be more insufferable than the pretense that you and you alone represent the truth, whether that is in contrast to a false religion, ideology, or mythology. Allow me to open this discussion, allow me to begin this video by instead contrasting one myth to another. Let's suppose a 12-year-old child asks you, where does democracy come from? How is it that new democracies are made in this world over, say, the last 100 years? And looking ahead, this child is getting old enough now that they're seeing and hearing things in the news, looking ahead to the next 100 years. Where, where does democracy come from? Now, you're talking to a child. You can tell the truth, but you can only tell so much of the truth. Perhaps to some extent, no matter how honest you want to be, you're going to engage in a bit of mythology, a bit of mythological reasoning. You're going to hint at or suggest some deeper truths, but you're going to simplify the reality of what history is and what's going on in politics uh, right here. All right. Well, you know, son... In Japan, democracy was created when they were conquered by the American army. Democracy is the system of government the Japanese committed to in negotiating the end of American military occupation. Does anyone alive think that Japan would have become a democracy if it had not been conquered by the American army? Does anyone think that Japan would have become a democracy if instead they had been conquered by the Russian army? And in case you didn't know, that was happening simultaneously. And that's why several islands in the north of Japan are Russian territory to this day. How did, uh, how did South Korea become a democracy? How did Taiwan become a democracy? Why is, why is Germany a democracy? How did any of these places become democracies? What's the origin of democracy? Couldn't we present a very different myth of democracy that does indeed tell you some of the truth, perhaps not all of it. Perhaps it simplifies Perhaps it overly simplifies history, but it picks and chooses certain facts from that history to tell you something that's really profound and important about politics in our own time. That's, that's where democracy comes from. And that's why Iraq has elections today. Do you think that if America had not conquered Iraq or if they had allowed ISIS to conquer and rule Iraq. Do you think there would be any pretense of democracy, any elections, any freedom of the press to criticize political leaders? Do you think that would exist in Iraq? And you know, the strangest thing about the type of mythology I'm attacking in this video is that it simultaneously wants to ignore India and yet also very cynically employ selected anecdotes about the political history of India in order to, you know, support their own hand. Where does, where does democracy come from? If it's a 12-year-old kid asking, if you have a 12-year-old son, let's just say to keep this protracted metaphor going, where does, where does democracy come from? Well, you know, son, more than 1 billion people live in democracy in India today. And do you know why that is? It's because they were conquered by the British Empire. Democracy in India is the system of government they settled on in negotiations that would end the military <laughs> occupation of India. It was an agreement. Their constitution was worked out completely through elite level politics. India is not a democracy because of street protests. No. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, and, and 
I'm sorry. Do you think, do you think if India had never been conquered by the British or if India had instead been conquered by the Japanese and the Japanese had never been conquered by the Americans, if it had been incorporated into the imperial, you know, Japanese co-prosperity sphere, Japanese empire. Do you think, do you think India would be a democracy today? Oh yeah. And you know, the hypothetical examples go much further than this. So we have a positive example, right? A positive example of how imperialism creates democracy in India and Sri Lanka. But why, why do you think Taiwan is a democracy and China isn't, mainland China? Why, why do you think that is? What kind of myth? Wait, do you, they just didn't have enough street protests? Is, is that what it is? They didn't have enough people holding up placards. They didn't have enough sexy women taking their clothes off and, and appearing on newspaper covers. Oh, attractive women take off their clothes for political cause. Headline news. <laughs> Tune in for the nightly news at six. There just weren't enough attractive women willing to get naked in China. There weren't enough young men chanting slogans and holding up. Is that is that what it is? Or... Are we willing to say that if one man in the United States of America, the man who happened to be president of the United States of America, had committed to oppose Mao Zedong, to oppose communism, to send in troops, if, you know, during World War II or after World War II, during that period of history, broadly speaking, you can, you can broaden out by 10 years on either end, frankly. But if during this long period of internecine civil war and revolution in China, if America had made the decision, made the commitment, then China would have democracy today. China had the misfortune not to be conquered by the American army, not to be conquered by the British Empire. Imagine how much better off China could be today if they had a political system just as good as what India has. Imagine how much better off China would be today if they had the political system Iraq has. Many of you will be saying or feeling, wow, what a tremendously bleak and dark picture of the world I've just presented with you. Is it? Is it bleak? Is it dark? Is it hopeless? Right now, Kazakhstan. Right now, Myanmar. Right now, Belarus. What hope do they have to achieve democracy? The only hope they have is that they're conquered by the United States of America. That is it. The only hope they have is that there is an American-led military intervention to create democracy, period. There is no other way for there to be democracy in Myanmar. There is no other way to have democracy in Belarus. There is no other way to have democracy in Kazakhstan. And there are marginal cases. The Ukraine will have as much or as little democracy as America is willing to buy. Oh yes, our most cynical allies in the world, the Ukraine, they got real interested in democracy precisely when the Russian army started taking away more and more. Than Not before that. You know, it's, it's pretty much simultaneous with their need to elicit support from the American government. They got real interested in democracy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, all of a sudden, the Ukraine represents uh, Western ideals of democracy against and in contrast to the Russians, right? That's, that's the game we're playing, at least on the level of propaganda. And many others, many other countries have tried to do this, you know, cynically. You know, oh, well, once we're in a civil war or once we're being invaded by some other country, now we'll try to present ourselves to the Americans. And look, you know, America isn't the only country in the world that has an army. It's just who's actually willing to show the initiative. India could conquer Myanmar. India could conquer Afghanistan. They could, you know, right now, 2022, I don't mean in retrospect, 2023, whatever, looking at the future, you know, India could, if you know anything about politics, they will only do that if they're in lockstep 
with the United States of America. It's impossible to imagine the, the Indian army uh, taking that initiative uh, without uh, some kind of collusion with some kind of encouragement from the United States. Remember, in, India has an enormous army and they're willing to take the casualties. There's a huge number of people would die. But yeah, that's, that's what we're talking. Oh, you want, oh, you thought democracy didn't involve killing people? Is that what you thought? <laughs> do you, did you think democracy was about peace? <laughs> do, do you think it was about equality? What do you think democracy is? Where do these myths come from? And what purpose do they serve? So uh, I'm asking you seriously, um, what are the consequences of even tolerating these myths about democracy in our times? Now, guys, I, I do see your comments from the audience coming in. If you have a second, hit the thumbs up button. More people can, uh, more people can join the conversation and more people can disagree with me. And I am interested in hearing your, your, uh, your disagreements. Um, okay, so I, I'm just just uh, going to respond to one person. I, sorry, I have a lot more to say. Somebody called the Galaxy Lab, who I've never seen in my audience before. No big deal, but welcome. I haven't. Uh, your name is not familiar to me. Says, quote, LOL, American-style democracy is an utter joke around the world. Have you been to South Korea? I have. What do you think about the difference between South Korea and North Korea. You think that's a joke? You think people aren't willing to fight and die for the difference between South Korea and North Korea? How about the difference between life in Florida and life in Cuba? You think that's a joke? You think American style democracy is a joke? You're wrong. Have you been to South America? Have you been to countries like Brazil and Colombia and Venezuela? Venezuela, horrifying example. I think there are a whole lot of people all around the world, whether they're in countries that are clinging to the fragments of democracy that are kind of just barely democratic or countries that are outright dictatorships who keenly feel and appreciate what the difference is between living in an American-style democracy and living in their current circumstances. Am I claiming American democracy is perfect? No. I'm telling you that if you were an intellectual born and raised in Iran, if you were an intellectual born and raised in communist China, those these people travel. You know, they take vacations in the United States. Some of them to have college programs, exchange programs. Okay. The difference between life in America and life under a despotic regime, it is no joke. It's deadly serious. And oh, I'm sorry. So I don't know if you even watched the news. You know, there was this hopeless revolution in Syria. All right. And even in Syria, do you know how many tens of thousands of people volunteered to fight and die for the possibility that their country could have American-style democracy instead of dictatorship, for the dream of a Syrian democracy. Now, yes, by the way, I realized that wasn't the only dream. There were also Muslim fundamentalists who were fighting because their dream was to have a even more, even more despotic, even less democratic society ruled by Sharia law. There were many dreamers with many different dreams but all these people stood up ready to fight and die for a democratic future in Syria. Given the level of education those people have, the level of political sophistication, the kind of repression they've been living under. All right? So have you, um, have you ever watched the footage of what happened in the Tiananmen Square protests in China? They built a Statue of Liberty. And those were all people born and raised under the most extreme communist dictatorship imaginable. They're people who grew up seeing uh, American imperialism vilified, American democracy denounced constantly. That's all they heard from their teachers. That's all they read in textbooks. It's a totally one-sided condemnation of American democracy. Okay, And the Tiananmen Square protesters, they were predominantly... Uh, university educated people. It's not worth getting into all the details. 
but they, they were. I mean, they were not uh, farmers and peasants and illiterate people from the countryside. The vast majority of them were university educated people in the downtown part of Beijing. And that's where it was. And that's who those people were. And they literally built a copy of somewhat artistic reinterpretation of the Statue of Liberty. All right. How easy for you to say, LOL, American style democracy is a joke around the world. Those people stood up and fought and died for democracy in China. They didn't, they didn't hypothetically risk their lives. They did risk their lives and they're dead now. Okay. And, and wasn't just them that died. For most of them, their parents were hunted down and killed. Their brothers and sisters were hunted down and killed. And this is Chinese style repression. It's not all at once. It's not overnight. It's over a few years so that the ripples aren't as noticeable. But step by step, those people and their relatives were erased. You think that's a joke? All right. Now, look, I can sit here and uh, from my privileged position, I can talk about the advantages of Swiss democracy over American democracy. I can talk about the advantages of Denmark over the United States of America. Okay. And also, as it happens, in terms of my education background, I can point to Taiwan as a very positive example of a well functioning democracy. And I've already mentioned Japan. There are, there are advantages to the Japanese system of democracy, to the Taiwanese system, Switzerland. You know, there are many models of democracy. Right now in Kazakhstan, right now in Myanmar, right now in Belarus, right now in Ukraine, is it Swiss democracy they're crying out for? Is it support and intervention from Switzerland? Is it Denmark they're reaching out for? Is it Israel? Is it Taiwan? Is it Japan? Is it India? No, it's American democracy. Okay. It's not British democracy either. It's not the British system of parliament. All right. Now, you could write a science fiction novel. I mean, you can imagine a different world where it's not American democracy. That's the dominant model. And you can imagine a different world where Japan, instead of being this nominally pacifist nation, is instead an incredibly hawkish, militant country pushing for democracy everywhere from Mongolia to Cambodia, but they're not, okay? I mean, the, the, the Japanese are sitting down and pouring sake into a cup and drinking with all the corrupt dictators throughout Asia. That's their style. They're not trying to make Myanmar into a democracy. They're not putting any pressure on Cambodia or Laos. They're pouring money into those countries and supporting dictatorship. And in case you hadn't heard, the Japanese also like to do business with Iran. Now, there are a lot of different reasons for that, but one of them is racism. You know, I'll tell you something about the Japanese attitude. The Japanese look at people like the Iranians and people like the Burmese and the Cambodians, and they just think, oh, well, you're not. You're not as advanced as us. You're not as sophisticated. You couldn't possibly have our system. There's a really deep dehumanizing racism that separates the Japanese uh, from the rest of the world. I, you know, obviously I'm not claiming the Swiss aren't racist. The Swiss have their own form of racism. The people of Denmark probably have their own kind of racism too, uh, so on and so forth. You know, but sure, there are reasons why it is America and America alone these people look to. And it's America alone that's, that's creating this model. You know? And yes, it's taken incredibly seriously. And there are incredibly serious consequences for the whole world, uh, for better and for worse. Now, look, guys, um, I remember eight years ago, and the world's changed a lot in eight years, there was this wave of YouTube channels and YouTube videos saying that you, yes, you could lead a better life if you packed your bags and moved to Japan. And these are videos mostly aimed at white Americans, to some extent, white Western Europeans, like maybe there were some British people and Germans and so on. But predominantly, it was white Americans who had a university education, 
And when they finished the university education, they finished a BA, they had no particular hope for a better life in the United States of America. No, no particular employment prospects. They may be looking at getting a job as a waiter or a waitress, some very humble employment after completing a bachelor's degree in university in the United States of America. And then there's this one path to money, fame, power, respect, and sex, probably more sex than anything else. And that is the root of relocating to Japan. The easiest at that time, most abundant form of employment was being in English as a second language teacher. So there's this huge kind of apolitical movement on YouTube. I mean, it didn't perceive itself as political. Reaching out to, pandering to, catering to university educated people in America who wanted a better life and didn't know how to get it and saying, hey, there's employment for you here in Japan. There's this much money. It's not really spectacular wealth, but you can earn a good living as a teacher in Japan. You can have a new and better life. So just that little bit of money I got to see how that inspired a whole ideology. Now, why do I say ideology? These people became consumed with it. And, you know, they start to fantasize maybe when they're in the middle of their university degree about this new and better life that can happen in Japan. And whether they are male or female, that once they get to Japan as a white American, suddenly There'll be so much more sexual interest in them. They'll be so much more handsome if they're a man. They'll be perceived as so much more beautiful as a white woman if they move to Japan, if they make themselves exotic. And they start studying the Japanese language and they start watching the cartoons. And if they weren't already playing the video games, playing even more of the video games, they start to admire the culture. They start to take on certain political attitudes. And I know people, I mean, most of these people became right wing. Sometimes they became left wing, but they became politically, you know, Japanophiles, started adopting this Japan centric view of the world. And a lot of people got on that train and didn't take the next step of actually moving to Japan. Many did. They went and they taught English in Japan, but they got it into their heads that a better life was possible for them personally. There was money to motivate them personally on that small scale. And then on a larger scale, there was a better model of society. Japan, a country with no unemployment. Japan, a country with no crime. Uh, 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 and here's the right wing part. Japan, a country with no immigration. And ironically, the people who subscribe to this view were themselves aspiring to be immigrants relocated to Japan. This was the Japanese model and the explosion of popular interest. In it. What's happened in the social media era of political organization, you know, is that there's a lot more money in this way, motivating people's thoughts, people's feelings, and ultimately people's activism, uh, shall we say. It's a very direct relationship between what you say, what you do, how you present yourself on camera, and how much money comes in in donations. Now, I have read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin represents the old model of politics. He literally owned the newspaper. He literally organized a salon saloon, if you like, um, a gentleman's book reading club. They would read a book and then come in and have a meeting and discuss what they'd read. These are the old methods of political you know, organization. And he would solicit donations by going in person. He would walk up to the doors of wealthy people's houses, wealthy people's mansions and manors, and he would speak to them face-to-face, -face. and uh, the term used back then was a subscription. He would ask them to take out a subscription in supporting a, a political cause. He was asking them for money, and he raised money for an enormous array of things. Just to give a couple examples, he opened a school, 
He created and opened a library. He created a street cleaning service. Um, so there are donations that were used to employ people to sweep and wash. The, they, I think they didn't even have sidewalks, but, you know, the streets such as they were at the time. There's a long list. And, and by the way, quite a few wars came and went before you get to the American Revolution. And that was, if you will pardon the non-vegan metaphor, that was shoe leather politics. Walk up to someone's door, knock on the door. Oh, it's Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> It's Benjamin Franklin asking you to donate money. Now, you know, I'm not a big fan of Benjamin Franklin. A certain kind of character, a certain kind of personality was attracted and rewarded. And there are certain barriers to entry in the politics of that era. I would say it's one in the same era from Benjamin Franklin all the way through to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the skill set you needed was precisely being a Christian preacher. And it's no surprise that so many of the populist democratic and semi-democratic leaders, they were in effect trained by the church. Right? What do you do as a, as a church pastor? I said, well, you have kind of two modes of communication. One is getting up at a pulpit, speaking to a crowd, whether that's 30 people or 300 people. And you practice that probably from childhood, maybe from your teenage years. You practice speaking to a crowd. And the other is sitting down and either with sincere humility or phony humility, talking to someone face to face about their problems. We right? call that counseling, I suppose. Right? Somebody like Martin Luther King Jr., right? This was the training he had that no offense, most of you in the audience don't have. If there's one person in the audience who's done this, let me know. Right? And guys, I have this training too. Right? Why do you think I'm so much better at this than all these jackasses who try to be leaders in the vegan movement and ecology? All right. I mean, I'm not going to digress here into my whole autobiography. But, you know, I recognize that I'm someone who in some ways could have thrived on the old model. Yes, it involved publications on paper, but crucially, I mean, you know, if, if Benjamin Franklin just had a stutter, if Benjamin Franklin had a speech impediment, right? None of us would be talking today about Benjamin Franklin, right? Uh, the ability to, with confidence, knock on someone's door. And, you know, at that time, it would have been a servant who answered the door. In many cases, it would have been a slave who answered the door. And you'd say, tell your master that Benjamin Franklin is here to talk to you, whether that was to ask for money for the war effort or to build a, <laughs> build a hospital or whatever his project at the time was. And that was that was really his whole career leading up to. I mean, he was already an old, old man when the American Revolution happened. He had this long career as a major political figure uh, before the revolution, before the writing of the Constitution, that he was tangentially involved in. He was slightly involved in the writing of the American Constitution. But really, his, his political career, he was already in the post-retirement period. He was in his old, old age at that stage. Um... Certain kind of person, a certain kind of profile for who can be a political leader, who can succeed, and who's going to be excluded by that old world of politics. Okay, well now, in the 21st century, we have a different kind of incentive structure and a different kind of person who's going to succeed. It's not Benjamin Franklin anymore, right? Wayne Siong. This man has no charisma, none, zero. He has no personality. He's not a good writer. He has nothing interesting to say. I've read his essays. To my knowledge, he hasn't written a book, but I've read his writing. It's not just his public speaking. That I've heard, right? There is absolutely nothing interesting about him. Wayne Siong raised millions of dollars in donations by just studying and responding to what it was that the audience wanted to hear. Now, you'll see why I'm mentioning this. This directly prefigures what happened with Extinction Rebellion. In many, many ways, whether you call it the marketing of Wayne Siong uh, Wayne Siong's organization is called DXE, Direct Action Network. 
or you think of it as actually the political philosophy of Wayne Sion. It is identical to uh, the philosophy of Extinction Rebellion. I think these are methods, tactics, tropes that we're now going to see exploited again and again because there are millions of dollars involved. Right? The motivation for people to behave this way and for political movements to organize this way in a, in a way that I feel is not just undemocratic, but anti-democratic, all right? It is spelled out in dollars and cents as never before. Sorry, let, let me just ask you real quick. When Benjamin Franklin wanted to be taken seriously, when he wanted political support and financial support, wanted donations, do you think he needed people to stand in the street holding placards and chanting? Is that where his base of political support came from? The difference is subtle, but it's not fucking subtle at all once you let yourself see it. You know, what up? Wow. Oh, we're dealing with a completely different era. Okay, so how does Wayne Siong make money? How does Wayne Siong have a multi-million dollar success story in the, you know, in some ways competitive world of putting out your shingle for your charity and saying, hey, 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 don't donate to those other guys. Donate to me. Other people promise they're going to make the world a better place. Never mind. First and foremost, bedrock commitment is to pseudoscience. He takes his political ideology and he misrepresents it to the audience as scientific fact. He claims that if you study the history of the world uh, throughout the whole of history, there's only one method of achieving progress that works. This is established and proven by quote unquote social science research. Some of you have been watching my channel for years, so you've heard me drawing attention to this and criticizing it for years. For some of you, it's your first time uh, thinking about this. He says, okay, it is a proven scientific fact that this and this alone is the way to social progress. And it's very telling what the examples are that he marshaled in support of that argument, say, in season one of uh, Direct Action Everywhere season one of his political movement, season one of his fundraising. Mohandas Gandhi, meant known to many of you as Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, if you want an example that directly prefigures DXE and Wayne Siong, I would point to the cult group or cult-like group, um, Landmark. So uh, Landmark and before it was called Landmark, it was called EST, E-S-T. And they changed their name for different reasons. They were always hammering home to people. Don't you want to be like Martin Luther King? Don't you want to be like Gandhi? And it's quite possible Wayne Seong himself attended a Landmark uh, event that he got this from. It's also possible he just got it from the zeitgeist, shall we say, what was floating around in our in pop culture at that time. Now, I pointed out to Wayne, and I, I have reason to believe it's not worth getting well. Wayne did hear my critique of his movement at that time. It'd be a long story to say how I know that, but one very simple example. He did put a tweet on Twitter that, that mentioned me and provided a link to my video. So that was that's some evidence, and I have other evidence. I have no reason to think Wayne is listening to this discussion we're having today or that he's become a fan of my channel in term. But I know that early on he did listen to my critique. And one of the fundamental questions to ask there is, look, how much do you really know about Mohandas Gandhi? <laughs> how, how much do you really know about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and how that example applies to your... So, you know, there were, there were these kinds of questions, all right? For the purpose of this video, that critique is, is irrelevant because I'm not pointing to the extent to which things are, are true or false. Taking the truth and falsehood as a whole, and I'm adumbrating it as mythology. This is a kind of mythology. Uh, it was presented, it was an incredibly powerful myth. The power of this myth is proven through its fundraising. People donated millions of dollars to support this myth. And sorry, so we just gone over it. Scientific fact. It is asserted as a scientific fact that there's only one way to achieve progress. And, and now they're going to show you what it is. Now they're going to tell you what it is. It's it's the same. I mean, this is like the the cult belief and the power of possible. Pardon me, the power of positive thinking. You know, oh oh, don't you know the secret? 
Don't you know the secret that made Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a success? Don't you know the secret that made Mohandas Gandhi a success? It's the same secret we're going to sell to you now. Sign up and donate. It's the same secret of democratic progress. Don't you know the secret that accomplished civil rights, equal rights for black people in the United States of America? Don't you know the secret that put an end to the Vietnam War? Can you guess what it is? I'll let you in on a secret if you donate $1 million to my phony-ass political charity. Don't ask any questions about what's being done with that money, about where it goes, or what we need a million dollars for. <laughs> is, is that what ended the Vietnam War? Was people donating millions of dollars? Is that is that all that happened? So there was this very um, tightly defined set of cultural touchstones, all of which were American. I mean, none of these have anything to do with the history of Germany. None of them have to do with the history of Japan, South Korea, and, and India. I mean, that's the most absurd thing of all. Like, they're, they're, they're invoking India, especially just the name of Mahatma Gandhi. I don't like to call him Mahatma, but I prefer to call him Mohandas. But anyway, he's Gandhi in either case. You know, the <laughs> India is being kind of cynically employed this way. But there's no interest in the political history of any other country or continent. There's no interest in the political history of Africa, the Caribbean, South America. These are all uniquely American cultural touchstones. But they're put out there in this tantalizing way. Oh, the reason why Martin Luther King Jr. was successful. The reason why the anti-Vietnam War protests were successful. It's, it's the secret. And that secret is a scientific fact. It's a rule. It's a law as inescapable as the laws of physics like gravity, like friction, like inertia. Millions of dollars. All right, thousands of people donated millions of dollars. Okay, that was the formula, you know, Wayne came up with. And, you know, anyone who goes through the sources from that time, you know, uh, you will see the extent to which his work was derivative of other people's writing. And there's nothing wrong with that. We can also see the ways in which it was original, that he took particular bits and pieces. Put them together. Now, it's important to recognize briefly the marketing ploy adapted and changed over time. So in the beginning, they claimed that they were not an organization. They claimed that they were a completely horizontal network of activists, that they had no leaders and no followers, no constitution, no organization. But then what are you donating to? Right? You got a problem. Right? I don't know if that lasted for one year or two years. I mean, I could get into the exact timeline. When did they remove those claims from their website? When was it replaced with a different you know, philosophy? They had a number of sex scandals. That was the turning point. And then they started to claim that they're not a fully horizontal organization. They're actually a very vertical organization. And there's, you know, there's one man in charge. And then below that one man, there's a council. They started to explicitly claim that they were a hierarchical organization. But my point is here, I mean, some elements of the mythology remain the same, but other elements changed with time. And they changed directly in response to what earned money and what didn't, what elicited donation, what solicited donations, I should say, and what didn't. So you know what? It turns out people hugging cute animals gets donations. That wasn't part of their founding mission and mandate, right? Their initial claim was that this one method of protest and disruption was the way to pursue social and political change. <laughs> they were against going into factory farms and taking film footage. That wasn't what their, their mission was about. They were not initially an organization based on rescuing and adopting animals. They were about disruption. I don't have to get into what that means. And they claim their method of disruption is the same thing that Mahatma Gandhi did and the same thing that Martin Luther King Jr. did, which is, again, questionable. When getting, but that, that's the myth. That's the mythology. Okay, well, guess what? Not that many people want to donate money to a bunch of fucking idiots standing in a restaurant holding placards, holding signs with slogans, chanting, it's not food, it's violence. That wasn't what got the money rolling in. 
breaking and entering, going into a factory farm, going into a slaughterhouse, going into these types of facilities and rescuing an animal or photographing yourself petting an animal. Okay. This got them the kind of attention from the press they wanted. This got them the kind of donations they wanted. All right. There were millions and millions of dollars involved here. Now, as I already stated in the preview to this video, so there's a, just a six minute video that sets up this conversation and invited people to be here for the live stream uh, a little more than an hour in advance. It is true that a crucial prelude to the success of DXE, Direct Action Everywhere, and, and shaping this, this changing notion we have of democracy, changing notion of public protests, changing notion of, how, of the pursuit of political change, you know, it was a very important prelude in the formation of the so-called effective altruism movement. Now, if you Google how much money did effective altruism manage to funnel, manage to move around, it is allegedly in excess of $1 billion. Maybe you can find an estimate somewhere that it's above $2 billion now or Obviously, there's a reason to lie or exaggerate that. I have no reason to think $1 billion is the correct number or $2 billion would have. But it is many, many, many millions of dollars that have been collected in donations or donations that have been budged around and reallocated. Uh, the amount of money involved with the so-called effective altruism movement is unbelievable. So again, this motivates this motivates people, right? Just the prospect that you can have a better life in Japan motivates people as i said earlier that's you know for kind of a survival salary but a salary and a quality of life and a social position position of influence and, and power and respect in japan that's better than what you have if you stay in kansas better than being a waitress in kansas you know um this powerfully motivates people so when we're talking about millions of dollars when we're talking about tens of millions of dollars and possibly hundreds of millions of dollars right can think about think about how distorting these motivations are. So guys, I'm, I'm happy to have your your comments here. I mean, I obviously I'm I can choose what I do and don't respond to, based on how interesting or salient or intelligent it is. Uh, frankly, so Brendan Williams asks, quote. In the past, you've mentioned Canada being a pseudo-democracy. Do you think our governance model is outdated? Someone said we have paleolithic emotions, medieval governance, but godlike technology. It's an interesting comment from Brendan. So Brendan, I've written a whole book about that. The book is called No More Manifestos. Um, buy it and read it. But yes, the book is a very harsh condemnation of the political systems we have both in the United States and Canada. But there's a kind of good news there too, right? Like, is this pessimism or is this optimism? Because the understanding I present of American democracy is basically that what is right with America is right despite its constitution, not because of it. And that's very good news. You know, um, I think it's much, much bleaker view of the world. Um, if you look at America and Canada as being inhabited by terrible people, but who have a wonderful constitution or a wonderful justice system, wonderful criminal law system or wonderful electoral system, but terrible people, that's much more pessimistic than saying, well, look, there's something really right about American culture. There's something really right about the American people. And um, it's unfortunate that they have a bad system of laws, a bad uh, system of uh, government generally. And so on. So I, I I regard that as as optimistic rather than pessimistic. Uh, but obviously, if you're a conventional jingoistic Canadian nationalist or something, all you want to hear is that Canada is a great system of parliament. I guess you could respond to that at least initially in a shallow way as as bad news or as kind of uh, disillusioning. So uh, uh, Menangoenka asks, "quote What are your thoughts on English democracy?" vis-a-vis -vis American democracy. So there's quite a lot of material on that in my book too, in No More Manifestos. And what's paradoxical about uh, American democracy is that it uh, presents itself as the antithesis to British democracy, right? It was a revolution against, a rebellion against 
the British, right? This is how it, this is how it presents itself. Um, and in so many ways, I mean, almost in every single way, instead, the system of government the Americans created was a continuation of the, the British parliamentary system. So again, I've written a whole book dealing with it. There are several chapters talking about this exact issue and these paradoxes and what, what's entailed by it. What's perhaps worth saying here briefly, um, Americans at that time, so during the revolution, during the negotiations surrounding the Constitution, this is a gap between you. First you have the revolution, then you have the Constitution. Um, Americans were presented with the myth that they were returning to the virtues of ancient Rome and ancient Sparta, the ancient Roman Republic, and specifically Sparta, not Athens. And what I try to show in the book in a powerful way is that that was a lie. I was not even false. It's really an intentional lie. And there was no attempt whatsoever made by the Americans. Uh, the, 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 we're talking about a small number of Americans, a small number of elite Americans, including Benjamin Franklin, including Thomas Jefferson, and including uh, John Adams, the people who directly participated in the creation of the American system of government at many stages, including my, my favorite, Governor Morris. Governor Morris, a fascinating historical figure. Um, so it's not a huge number of people. We're generalizing right here. It's a few dozen people. Um, they were aware of the model of government in ancient Athens, ancient Rome, ancient Sparta. They did know about these things. And there was absolutely no interest in creating a republic on that model, democracy on that model, et cetera. So, yeah, that's my, my comment about that. And, again, you get, I think, reflections on that that are really useful, that really have pragmatic value, pragmatic importance now in the year 2022 and moving forward. I'm not just talking about history for what it adds to our understanding of history. I'm talking about history for the way it can change politics now and, and in the future. Yeah. By the way, so I'm not offended by these questions. Um, Wicked Energy uh, asks, uh, quote, Eisel, would you do a response to someone anti-democratic like Nick Fuentes, close quote. So I'll just say very briefly, um, the critique of Wayne Siong is not popular on my channel. Nobody wants to hear me talk about Wayne Siong. The critique of Roger Hallam. So Roger Hallam is the leader of um, Extinction Rebellion. Thing. Uh, so this e ecological movement to do with climate change, Extinction Rebellion. The, no one wants to see my videos about Roger Hallam. Like people, people watch my videos about Roger Helm and Extinction Rebellion, because they're interested in me. I'm not drawing in any new viewers that way. Nobody's interested in that topic. And most of my viewers, they wish I was talking about something else. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I am engaged in the analysis of figures like Wayne Siong and Roger Helm, including right now in this, in this video, because I really genuinely think there's something for you in the audience to learn from it of tremendous importance. And with no false humility, there's something for me to learn from it too. Like I learn, I benefit from the analysis of what's going on with those, those political leaders. So when you talk about someone like Nick Fuentes and another example would be in Mendham, um, you know, it might be more popular. I might, it might be more salacious and more entertaining for me to lay into, for me to in an over the top way, condemn Nick Fuentes or criticize and condemn in Mendham. But I, I really don't think there's uh, anything much to to learn from it, you know, for me or for you. So, you know, obviously I'm not saying this to then slam the door on it, but, you know, I have, if you look through my channel, I have criticized many extreme political figures, communists, uh, fascists, all, all kinds of different people. But, uh, you know, if you think about what is the educational value of critique or what's the, what's the political value of it? Sure. Sometimes, you know, so, so another example, I, I think, Nobody has ever asked me to criticize Sargon of Akkad. I think his real name is Carl Benjamin. I, I'm sorry, approximately. Uh, I, nobody's ever asked me to criticize Sargon of Akkad. Now, I've had a couple of videos, uh, at least kind of mentioning him. It's, it's come up a couple of times, right? You know, I'm not going to say there's zero value to that. But sure, one I'm engaged in the, in the critique of, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's all I'm saying. Well, how much... How much value is there in, in engaging in a particular kind of uh, political criticism? Now, and by the way, my time is limited. 
my money is limited. It is, <laughs> you know, I think there would be tremendous value right now about uh, delving into a critique of the politics of Kazakhstan. All of Syndicate. I think it's tremendously important. And I feel I can't do it. I feel I can't take the time. And, you know, no offense. I'm not like blaming you in the audience, but I don't have the audience to support me in doing that either. You know, I mean, you can imagine if I had 1 million viewers and 10,000 of them were really willing to support me financially as well as just with viewing numbers in, in, in digging in deeper and deeper into the current politics of Kazakhstan, I'd love to do it. Uh, Myanmar, I would love to make more videos talking about Myanmar, right? But uh, so, so yeah, these are, you know, in, in pragmatic terms, this is what you... This is what you get into. Now, as unpopular as it may be for me to talk about in this video, as my examples, uh, Roger Hallam and um, Wayne Siong, I can mention here also Peter Singer. No, nobody wants to hear me talk about Peter Singer. Okay. <laughs> nobody, not even vegans who've been watching my channel for eight years. Nobody wants to hear me talk about Peter Singer. But th those at least are faces people in my audience can immediately relate to and you care about to some extent. And, you know, political leaders in Laos, in Kazakhstan, in Myanmar, yeah, even Thailand, nobody is, you can't even really imagine who I'm talking about or why you can't relate to it. Uh, and yeah, by the way, Peter Singer is another figure who's going to come up in, in today's discussion. Uh, so those of you who don't know who Peter Singer is, you can Google it now <laughs> if you've never heard of Peter Singer. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's something to say for that, but sure. I really sincerely believe that what I'm, what I'm doing here is important. And again, it has pragmatic real world value and real consequences. So just say this also at this point, uh, by the way, guys, if you have a second, hit the thumbs up button. It helps more people uh, discover the video while it's going and uh, it'll help more people discover it later too, but it'll help more people actually join this, this conversation. You know, um, talent is scarce. Okay. There is absolutely no jealousy in my heart whatsoever. But if you think about over a 10 year period, how much money was there going into non-communist, non-socialist utopian projects? You know what? Sorry, let's let's flesh all about. Also, non-fascist, <laughs> uh, non-Christian, non-Muslim. Right? If you think about the political spectrum, the area I'm interested in is in the middle. Like it doesn't go too far left and doesn't go too far right. There's a certain number of millions of dollars that are going to be donated to someone. Wayne Siong took a couple million of those dollars. James Aspie, I don't know how much, but I mean, you know, <laughs> certain amount of that money was taken up by, by James Aspie. You know, uh, Black Lives Matter. So I've seen the number 90 million. I, I Good luck finding responsible, serious accounting of how much money in total went to, to Black Lives Matter. Many, many millions of dollars in this period of time, we'll say 10 years, went to Black Lives Matter. PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animals. I'm saying like within that middle range, like obviously we could include Christian fanatics, Christian fundamentalists, Mormons, uh, Muslim uh, extremists. We could include far right wing fascists and so on. And if you wanted to on the left, you could include communist utopian projects, right? But within, if we exclude them, say, okay, so how much money is there, right? And then how many talented people are chasing after or soliciting that money? There is a very real sense in which the success of Peter Singer necessarily <laughs> entails someone else's failure. The fact that Direct Action Everywhere got that money, the fact that Wayne Young got that money, the fact that Anonymous for the Voiceless got that money, again, they're in the multi-million dollar camp, the fact that even fucking Dr. Greger got those millions of dollars, right? That means those millions of dollars didn't go somewhere else. And yeah, I can say straight up, it didn't go to me and it didn't go to anyone I support, right? Now, again, within the middle spectrum, I wasn't mentioning, sure, uh, Dr. Greger, you know, it was a really boring movement like PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Like we talk about some really non-radical political movements that are there in the, in the, in the middle of the spectrum tussling for that money. How much money was donated to Cenk Uyghur, the leader of the Young Turks? Uh, Young Turks, an American news slash Baltimore. You know, there are only so many millions of dollars going around. And it, even if you didn't think there was any harm being done by Wayne Seong, if you thought this was kind of harmless and pointless, even if you didn't think there was any harm being done 
by Peter Singer and the causes that people are actively are donating to, right? There is a different kind of harm just because of the finitude of, uh, I don't know, we could call it the ecosystem of charity here, right? There, there is competition and it's not survival of the fittest. So I'll, I'll just come back to this briefly. I've already outlined this. So I can say this briefly. If you've just joined us now, you might not know what I'm talking about. Okay. As I already said, right? A certain kind of person was able to raise money a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. Someone like Benjamin Franklin could stand. And by the way, Benjamin Franklin dressed like an aristocrat. He presented himself. He would wear his, his best clothes and so on <laughs> by designer clothing imported from Paris. And he presented himself as a scientist. And at that time, scientists dressed like aristocrats. They didn't wear a lab coat. They wore, I mean, you can look it up. <laughs> they wore ermine and they wore sans culotte. They wore, uh, oh, I'm sorry. They wore culotte, not sans culotte. They wore culotte. They wore silk stockings and short pants and frilly, uh, I can't even say neckties. They had frills around their necks. This was how Benjamin Franklin presented himself. A, a self-made aristocrat, a self-made gentleman and a scientist and so on, right? Certain kind of person uh, could raise money and build a, a political movement. And, and Benjamin Franklin was incredibly successful, as I say, long before the American Revolution. Really, the American Revolution is kind of the end of his career. And then he's a very old man in the writing constitution. Uh, so, you know, just, but that's that's at the end of his uh, his, his period of, of greatness and power and influence. You know, but he was a tremendously powerful man for many, 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 many decades. OK, um, so if you talk about this as a kind of ecology, right? Who wins? Well, it's a certain kind of dishonesty that wins. It's a certain kind of myth. And as I was trying to get into briefly, I don't, I don't need to talk about it in greater depth. When you look at the success of direct action, when you look at the success of Wayne Seong, from my perspective, everything they're saying is a lie. It's all totally dishonest. But the lie changes over time. It adapts. They're adapting their marketing strategy. They're adapting their mythology as they're making more and more money and they see what's what's successful and what what's not, right? So now, again, I, I do not think today Benjamin Franklin and his methods would be successful. I, I wouldn't say they're totally unsuccessful, um, but, you know, I, I just, I don't think that's the winning formula today. How well would Benjamin Franklin do on Instagram? You know, really, you know, you, you know a certain type of personality is going to succeed in the era of political political donation hunting, whatever you want to call it here, political fundraising, uh, uh, the post-social media era. Now, if you guys have been watching my, my channel for more than five years, you've heard me say this before. It's not all bad news. When my father was a kid, when my father was a teenager, whether you're looking at the Vietnam anti-war movement or the, the Black Lives Matter movement of its day, groups like the Black Panthers, people had very little information at their disposal when they made their commitment to supporting a group or joining a group, one charismatic guy would stand up and give a speech and hand out pamphlets. And that was it. People really gambled with their life. People ended up joining black radical movements and not realizing what they were joining. You know, they didn't, they didn't have any ability to Google it and hear multiple perspectives. And they didn't just be honest with you. So this is one hour. I don't think they really got to learn and got to ask questions and have an in-depth nuanced, nuanced relationship with the leader of their movement the way people do today. So, I mean, you know, my father told me different anecdotes about when he was a young man and he was, he was fascinated by this <laughs> very different character from me, my father, you know? Um, but he was, he was fascinated by this, but he himself and all these idealistic people in the 1960s, they were committing to and supporting radical political movements uh, not just with their money, but with their lives. You know, you're risking your professional reputation. You're risking whether or not you're ever going to be employed again, joining, you know, often extremist and really stupid political movements. So by the way, going back to that era, look at what the left wing was doing in relation to Israel and Palestine. They're still crazy now. I mean, the left wing is still crazy about Israel-Palestine. But the level of ignorance in the 1960s and the extent to which people were making these decisions based on a one-sided lecture, a one side, like a demagogue standing up and giving you a fiery lecture and a, and a pamphlet. And then people were really gambling their lives. And sometimes, sadly, they actually killed other people too. They were radicalized and engaged in, you know, violent action that should change their own lives or change everyone else's lives. Forever. It wasn't just money being gambled. And people were making those decisions on the basis of 
you know, what, what we now call in politics a stump speech and a pamphlet. So fundamentally, things have gotten better. Just because any of you now, if, if anyone is in this audience for the first time, give me a shout out. If you say, hey, this is the first time I've ever seen you on YouTube. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the audience. Any of you can say, oh, well, who is this guy? And you can read essays I wrote 10 years ago. Now, in some ways, that tells you who I am now. In some ways, it doesn't. It tells you who I was 10 years ago. You can read essays I wrote about democracy and communism and history and politics. And at a minimum, you can see, oh, this guy really cares about this stuff. And you can watch YouTube videos I did. You can watch YouTube videos talking about Star Wars and Batman, but also talking about Socrates and Aristotle and the books I've read. And you can learn a lot about me. And you can decide how much you want to trust me. It's not all or nothing. Like the old model, these were really serious commitments. They were binary. They were black and white commitments. You know, seriously, everyone forgets how violent the American Revolution was. Everyone forgets. Okay. People came to your door and asked, which side are you on? And if you chose the wrong side, you were dead. And if you chose the right side, you might get killed anyway. You know, being a so-called loyalist was a death penalty offense in the streets of New York. People were killed and people were uh, even more commonly, they were beaten up and had all their property taken away from them because the revolutionaries were money hungry. But you know, if you didn't say the right thing, Governor Morris himself come to your door and shake you down and steal your money and possessions and your horses or whatever you had to be stolen. It was, it was really gruesome, uh, door to door, you know, coercive, bloodthirsty, you know, it was, it was terrible. This, the, the American Revolution even, you know. So I just say, in the earlier period of history, very high level of commitment, very simple binary decision in front of you. You know, and today, you can choose to trust me to some extent, you know. You, you, can, you can say, you know what, this guy Eisel, I believe he knows what he's talking about on these topics, but then when he's talking about this other stuff, I think he doesn't know what he's talking about. And I don't, I don't smoke. Totally fine. You know what I mean? Totally. You, you can choose to believe that I know what I'm talking about when I talk about democracy. But, you know, when I talk about um, sexual politics, gender politics, there's an example. You think I'm totally wrong or I'm just ignorant that I don't know what I'm talking about. We're all, we're all infinitely ignorant. <laughs> you know, sure. You know, by the way, I'm not suggesting that I'm wrong about gender politics. No. No, I'm saying that you might think that I'm, you know, there's kind of a whole spectrum of levels of commitment. And of course, you can take all this stuff in your own, in your own direction. So anyway, there are ways in which the current model of political activism and fundraising, it's better than anything that happened before. All right. But most of what we're talking about here today are precisely the ways in which it's worse. Within this ecosystem, who wins? Whoever lies the most. Whoever fashions a lie. Whoever fashions the mythology that solicits donations, right? And now we get to do this on this social media platform where you get feedback from the audience. I mean, you know, someone like Wayne Siong, someone like Peter Singer, someone like uh, Paul Bashir, um, forgetting the other example, one easier. But anyway, uh, uh, someone like Roger Hallam, they get to see in real time what's getting donations and what isn't. They get to see what kind of publicity stunts, yeah, get them into the newspapers, but what makes them money? They get a feeling for the pulse of what's profitable in politics like never before. And they get to change their meth message. They get to change their myth until they have just the right mix to bring in millions of dollars. That's what's going on. Now, look, sorry, I just want to say again, very briefly, it requires a certain kind of personality. And the old system of politics did too. Not everyone in this audience can stand in front of a church and say, well, you know, not everyone has what it takes to be an MC and move the crowd. And I say this as someone, I do have what it takes, but morally and ethically, I never would, right? I can't bring myself to become a, a Presbyterian who performs funeral ceremonies, not even if it makes people feel better. You know, and it's so easy to put yourself in the religious mindset where you tell brokenhearted people what they're going to find uplifting, where you just sit there and you tell someone, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for your loss, but I want you to know he's in a better place. I would never do that. Just that little bit of mis dishonesty, just that little bit of... Uh, Manipulation. 
And I mean, it may not directly bring money into your church. It may not directly bring money into your political movement. But the fact that you took the time to sit down and talk to a widow about the death of her husband and, and tell her what she wanted to hear about God or Jesus or the afterlife or whatever. I mean, even communists do this shit. It's just a different mythology. You know, that widow will now donate money to you month after month, year after year for a decade. Like you can, you can secure long-term financial support just by lying to people and just by manipulating people. Okay. It takes a certain kind of character, you know, yeah, and you can talk about charisma or talk, you know, yeah. It takes a certain kind of ethical commitment and a certain kind of propensity for evil, a certain kind of pliancy, a certain kind of pliability, a willingness to do things that are really blatantly dishonest, bad, evil, and wrong to succeed in the old political system. And in the new era of social media, right? It's a different kind of character. It's a different kind of dishonesty. It's a different kind of evil. But I'm saying to you, it's the same sort of thing. I could never lie to my audience. I could never manipulate my audience just as much as James Aspie does, right? To me, that's unacceptable, right? And James Aspie, he's way more honest than, than Wayne Siong. He's way more honest than Roger Hallam, right? And, and look at what Roger Hallam does. You, can, you don't have to go to his YouTube channel. You just look at my YouTube channel. Look at my own YouTube videos, but Roger Hallam. The way he stands in front of an audience of teenagers and tells them millions of people are dying right now, even that's not true, even that's a lie. Like every single thing he's telling them, from my perspective, it's a lie. It's either a lie or a half truth, right? It's a lie, 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 lie. He's, he stands there and what is he trying to sell them on? He's telling them that the only way to pursue social and political change is to put yourself in jail is to serve a jail sentence. And I've quoted him on this. He said the only place for any Christian to be, and he means here a good Christian, a true believing Christian, so the only place for a Christian to be in our society today, in the 21st century, is in jail. Every good Christian should be putting themselves in, in prison. He wants to motivate his teenage followers to go to jail, right? I will not lie to my audience even as much as Durian Ryder does, I will not lie to my audience, all the diet gurus, I don't know, fully raw Christina, whatever. I won't lie about weight loss. I won't lie about exercise, right? I'm not willing to tell people what it is they want to hear for money, right? And what I'm saying to you is the ecosystem we have now, yes, in some ways similar to, but in some ways different from the ecosystem of soliciting political donations we had before, right? It is actively recruiting and encouraging and arming and funding a certain kind of myth, a certain kind of myth maker, a certain kind of lie, a certain kind of liar. And it's excluding other kinds of people. Sorry, various uh, interesting comments here, although I can't, uh, I can't ask them all. So um, a good question, although it's not particularly at the top of this video. Uh, someone asked, quote, did you do EST slash landmark yourself? So this is this cult-like group, whether or not it's technically a cult. Uh, and he says, quote, it reminds me a bit of Eckhart Tolle in that it regurgitates ancient texts idea and ideas, as you mentioned. Um, so you're correct that it resembles uh, Eckhart Tolle. It also regurgitates ideas from kind of Sigmund Freud and, and pop psychology. Um, you could make a comparison to Scientology also in this in this respect, Scientology and, and Dianetics. So the short answer question, no, I've never, I've never, I'm, I'm not stupid enough to do that. Um, you know, okay, an example like Landmark, it's partly relevant to this discussion and partly irrelevant. It's relevant because they have the same kind of fundraising going on. It's it's that is a very money motivated organization. It's about pay, sign up now, and then once you've paid, you got to pay for the advanced course. You know, it's kind of pay more and more. But the difference is, they're only promising to transform you and your life, right? They're not promising to transform society as a whole. They're not promising political goals on a grand scale. 
It's just your salvation that they're offering. So that's, yeah, that, that's, that's the difference. Um, but sure, it's relevant to this discussion partly, even if it's only that fundraising element and the totally dishonest use of history. The, the, the you know, cherry picking from history and misrepresenting and lying about history to support their own ideology. That's how it came up here. What they say about Mahatma Gandhi, what they say about the Buddha, what they say about all kinds of, eh. So it's, it is it is very similar to what Wen Xiong has done. And then as I say, Wayne Xiong, he seems to directly prefigure, he seems to be the template for Roger Hallam and Extinction Rebellion. And look, my point is not that these are finite examples. All, all of these, uh, Roger Hallam and, and, and Wen Xiong, they directly follow in the pattern created by the so-called effective altruism movement that involves and includes uh, Peter Singer. And again, many, many millions of dollars involved there, perhaps more than $1 billion, Mi huge, huge amounts of money, so-called effective, effective uh, activism movement. My point is not that these are unique stars in the sky. My point is that this is a vast constellation and more and more people are going to imitate and reproduce these same strategies, not because it's effective in creating political change. No, because it makes money, because it makes the demagogue, it makes the person on YouTube, the person on Instagram rich now. My thesis is that it's a complete failure in terms of what, what you want is democracy or what you want is uh, political change or social change. I don't think it's effective in that sense at all. The problem is precisely that it makes you into a, somebody like Eckhart Tolle. You're someone who can live forever on donations and publishing your next book and just, you know, just sitting around and lazily giving interviews, you know, and, and I think that's fair to say, like, I think it is fair to say Roger Hallam is becoming a new Eckhart Tolle. I think that's a great comparison. I, I think Wayne Xiong tried to become a new Eckhart Tolle. Maybe briefly he was, you know. Maybe he'll succeed that way again. He's he's had some problems, partly because of sex scandals and what have you. He hasn't been as successful that way. But I think that is completely fair to say that that's kind of the next step of the pattern for those for those people. And you can remain perpetually on the interview circuit, on the book promotion tour for the rest of your life. That money and fame can last forever for that individual. You know. Now again, even even Peta, the founder of Peta, people with the ethical treatment of animals. You know, what, what is, in what sense are they successful? They're successful in making her one woman uh, rich and famous. You know, that's that's the way in which it succeeds. They're totally unsuccessful in terms of the pursuit of actual political outcomes, social change, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, a number of, a number of, uh, a number of questions here. Uh, quote, do you think the decline of America has to do with constant leftist propaganda? So, sorry, I'll say that again. Quote, do you think the decline of America has to do with constant leftist propaganda? Close quote. Okay. What decline? I don't regard America as in decline. When, when was it better? The 1980s? The 1960s? The 1940s? You got to be kidding. I don't regard America as a decline, so I don't agree with that that part of the assessment. Again, you heard me if you were here an hour ago or something. You know, oh, do you think from the perspective of Myanmar, from the perspective of South Korea, you think American democracy is a joke? It's not. Now, you know, you know again, I'd, I'd be happy if Switzerland were competing with America, if Swiss democracy were really something we could compare to it as an option. Um, but we can't. You've already heard what I what I have to say about that. So I don't actually agree with the assessment that America is in, is in a period of of decline. And again, very simply, okay, Hollywood, Hollywood movies. Do you think they're in decline? Do you think the cultural dominance worldwide of America is in decline? Do you think American culture has less influence in China today, in Africa today, in South America today than it had 50 years ago? I don't even know what we did, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, what are we going to say? No, America is more influential. It's more powerful in every way, like militarily, uh, culturally, uh, in terms of its system of the market, in terms of everything else. So, I mean, this is the, this is the reality. Now, by contrast, how influential is Russia? You know, are you kidding me? There's no, 
when was the last time you watched a Russian movie? You know, like, you know, in Russia, they punch above their weight. They're, they're, you know, they're more influential than, they're more influential than some other countries. I get it. You know, if you're going to put on a spectrum, they're not at a zero. But no, the, so I, I don't actually agree with the, the assumption that America is in decline. You know, secondly, what is the effect of leftist propaganda? The main effect of leftist propaganda is passivity. It's not revolution. It's not riots. It's not militating for social change. The main effect of leftist propaganda, shall we say the last 30 years, has been to encourage thoughtless conformity. Right? So th this is my honest answer to you. The, the, the problem with leftist propaganda isn't any particular change they did accomplish. It's the changes that, that never were accomplished. You know, it's what it's what didn't happen. It's what hasn't happened. It's it's the um, the propensity for the pursuit of change that that never that never came. So you know, I feel for my generation, I've lived in a in an unspeakably um, passive society. You know, um, I could digress. You know, uh, I mean the very basic assumption that if you want change, you got to go out and get it. If you want a better life, if you want a better society, you've got to make it, you know, that's absent from the left. Uh, no, again, I don't want to make this into a lengthy critique of what left-wing attitudes are, or even left of center attitudes are, but you know, I'm old enough to remember Bill Clinton you know, I do think it's fair to say that Bill Bill Clinton's wealth and Shawang, Bill Clinton's view of the world, you know, not a philosophy, not an ideology, but a set of assumptions about what the world is and how it works. You know, Bill Clinton's left of center view of the world, it has been dominant and it continues to be dominant. Um, Bill Clinton went to church. Any of you believe Bill Clinton was a Christian? Bill Clinton prayed on camera and laughed and clapped. I can't remember him weeping in church, but he sometimes looked sad and serious in church. Bill Clinton pretended to be a Christian. You know, it, this is just one example, but it's a tremendously important one. How much progress have we made towards having an atheist society, a truly secular society, an anti-clerical society during the reign of Bill Clinton, and in the decades since. Zero. You know? <laughs> have, you, have you ever heard anyone on the left attacking Bill Clinton for being Christian, for being pro-church? Do you know anyone on the left who's engaged in an anti-clerical struggle? Like, sincerely, not on the level of bullshit uh, uh, comments on Instagram or Twitter, but someone who really sees that as part of the political struggle here now. This is only one example. But the unspeakable passivity of our political culture. It has everything to do with the phony radicalism of the left wing. You know, now I, I won't say who this was, but I, <laughs> I'm tempted. I heard an anecdote from a professor and she is left wing and her students are left wing. And she dared to complain that students were coming to class wearing pajamas. They weren't really wearing proper clothes that nobody was making effort from their parents. Couldn't we have a dress code? Couldn't we have some minimum standards for how well dressed the students were? And you can imagine all the left wing people reviled this professor and insulted her for not being left wing enough. Now, you know, this is this is very telling. So, and by the way, this professor, she's she's a she's a communist. She's not just she's not a Bernie Sanders left wing person. She's not a Joe Biden left wing person. She's an outright communist. She's extreme left wing. But that's still not left wing enough. Now, why is that? Why is it on a deep level that leftism represents lassitude, self-indulgence, lack of motivation, lack of self-discipline? And of course, smoking marijuana, decriminalizing drugs, encouraging a life of doing nothing but getting high and playing video games, quote unquote, doing your own thing, man. Why is it that the left is associated with you know, fat acceptance, you know what I mean? All these, all these things that, that fundamentally and integrally have to do with self-indulgence, right? 
Well, that is what the left has become. And I don't think uh, Bill Clinton produced this tendency. You know, I think he exemplifies the tendency. I think he's a useful focal point in moment in history to say, look, this is the left, not just the far left wing, not just the communists and socialists, the mainstream left. They created Bill Clinton. They accepted Bill Clinton. And they still are Bill Clinton. The people in political power today, they're Bill Clinton's age and maybe 10 years younger. That's the political culture that created them and that they in part created. And I think Bill Clinton is totally comfortable with marijuana, decriminalizing drugs, sleeping with prostitutes, um, fat acceptance. Maybe that's a stretch. I don't know where he stands with the fat acceptance. You know, the, the, you know, Bill Clinton's not, he's not a communist. He's not far left. He's, he's center left. He almost defines the center of the political spectrum today. Right. Um, so no, <laughs> that's what I have to say. One, I don't believe America is in decline. I don't believe it has declined. Um, and, and I don't even believe America has hit its pinnacle yet. I don't. I, I, if you guys haven't watched my earlier videos, haven't you heard? America is now finally in an alliance with India against China. It's a huge turning point in the history of the world. America finally ended its alliance with Saudi Arabia. It's a huge turning point in the history of the world. It really matters. Um, America's influence in India is now going to grow. Um, again, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, it's, it's possible Joe Biden will retire and everything will fall apart. But America has now gotten on a track that's very powerful um, in relation to India, in relation to Africa, in relation to South America. Um, even though America has spent this enormous amount of money uh, you know, they do have a huge debt crisis. No, I, I think on the contrary, if you're looking at the next 20 years, who do you think is going to be more influential in South America, in Africa, in India, in Southeast Asia? You think it's Russia? I, again, even if it's some country we like, like Switzerland, you think, you think there's going to be a wave of Swiss influence uh, around the world? So no, I think actually we are looking ahead to a period of much more intense, much more powerful and more muscular American influence partly because America's political agenda has fundamentally become more coherent. Um, and look, you know, I, I, I'd i love it if there were other voices competing with America this way, but Japan isn't going to do it. Taiwan isn't going to do it. You know, like I like, I like Taiwan in some way. Like politically, Taiwan is also a democracy. They also have health care. You know what I mean? Like there are good things about Taiwan. But Taiwan is totally in this kind of defensive position of just trying to follow America's lead and ride on America's coattails. And most of the other voices for democracy. Um, what? Sorry. Finally, finally, Angela Merkel has retired. I hate Angela Merkel. Okay. Um, what do you think is happening next for Germany? Do you think Germany is going to lead a fucking crusade for democracy in Belarus? Do you think Germany is going to carry the banner of democracy? to Myanmar, anywhere, any of these examples. No. What do you think Germany's going to do for Mexico? Mexico needs help too. It's falling apart, you know? Sorry, I mean, Mexico needs, Germany isn't going to do shit for anyone but Germany, right? So, you, you know, yeah, sure. Maybe the world would be a better place if there were other powerful pro-democratic voices in the world. Um, but it's not going to be Brazil. It's not going to be Colombia. I remember now it's like 20 years ago. People used to be building up this idea. Oh, it's Brazil's decade. Brazil is finally going to become this major power in the world. Really? Really? <laughs> you know, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm incredibly pessimistic. The next 10 years for Brazil, any of them, Venezuela, you know, what have you. So, no, I mean, looking ahead to the next 10 years, um, you know, I, again, I'm not saying this because I hate Australia. What the fuck do you think Australia is going to do in the next 10 years? You know, in Australia, they're in a very defensive position in relation to China. And so, anyway, I, I, I'm going on, but I'm sorry. I think, given what I said earlier in this video, I think it was worth really staying on that for a moment and just taking seriously this assumption of American decline. And, you know, and, and again, now that America is no longer in a paradoxical, completely self defeating alliance with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. The amount, and by the way, it looks like America is going to end its alliance with Turkey. That's not 100% clear yet, but it looks like they're also making an enemy out of Turkey. 
that's 80 20. It's like 80% certain, 20% uncertain what America's position in Turkey is going to be. So, do you think America's influence in Iraq is going to be more or less? I think it's going to be more or less in uh, in Iran and uh, in everything in relation to Israel. It's you just say we're going to an era where, where America's agenda is actually more coherent um, and, let, let, as I say, it's very simply less, less self. Uh, Yeah, so, sorry, some things here I can say very briefly. I have written about and researched the political history of Mongolia. Someone's interested in what I have to say about Mongolia. Just, just reading your comments, guys. Questions about uh, when the book is coming out. So I'm doing the final edits on the book now. So, you know, um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, I am unhappy that I'm apparently going to have to self-publish. If you guys check my blog, obviously you can see this through Patreon, but I also have a blog that's free. Um, you could see my communications with one publisher, but it really would be better for me if I could publish with somebody so part of me wants to get the book out into the world as soon as possible, but some part of me thinks, well, maybe I should, maybe I should try to actually publish. I mean, if we're moving permanently to Los Angeles, maybe I can get a real publisher to do it. And by the way, the book is also being translated into Spanish. So if I now learn Spanish as a language, that'll be nice. I'll get to improve my Spanish by reading my own work in translation. Um, but yeah, the, the book is mostly done. And the, the revisions are really clarifying what's there. Like, I'm not changing it, but it is. It, I'm just it, The argument, it is clearer. Uh, the final text is clearer than the earlier draft. Uh, maybe it loses some of its uh, wistful quality and being a little bit too clear. But no, I mean, if you compare them, uh, it's the in every chapter, it's the same point being made. But the revisions have made things clearer. Extra examples are added, things like that, in the process of revision. Okay, so great comment from longtime viewer and supporter of the channel. Do you, quote, do you want to give me a kiss? That's the name he uses. Um, he said, quote, maybe what influenced the public's expectations of PR stunts, so public relations stunts of this kind by NGOs and political groups doing fundraising, is Greenpeace raising banners in nuclear power plants and co covering coloring rivers, green, et cetera. Okay, so at the beginning of my channel, I talked about this and I made this same point. I met and spoke to the founder of Greenpeace in Toronto. And that's not that surprising because he was hanging around in Toronto, if you know who that guy was, with nothing better to do. Um, and he was an idiot. Never became vegan. Never quit drinking alcohol. Never quit smoking cigarettes, to my knowledge. If he did, it was late in life. It's possible. It's possible he quit smoking cigarettes toward the end. I shouldn't say that. But anyway, he smoked cigarettes and drank alcohol most of his life. Real, know-nothing, pathetic excuse for a human being. Um, I, I would completely agree that Greenpeace is an important precedent. And they have inspired a certain kind of activism, both on the right wing and the left wing. So if you look at what the right wing anti-immigration activists did, they're straight out of Greenpeace's playbook, right? Now, however, you know, how relevant is Greenpeace to our discussion today? I, I think it's fair to say they're more irrelevant than relevant. All right, so let's say the part that's relevant is Greenpeace, like Roger Hallam, Greenpeace, like Wayne Siong, Greenpeace, like the social media movements that we have today. It's based on a competition for newspaper coverage. It's based on a very fundamental misconception, misperception, or intentional lie that the pursuit of political progress and the pursuit of self-promotion through the mainstream media are one and the same. They're not, right? So Greenpeace would do things, sometimes ridiculous over-the-top things, um, you, you know, classic examples, having their boat ram into another boat and destroy a boat, climbing on board a boat, you know, these kinds of acts of uh, sabotage, I suppose, against other other boats, you know, actually 
colliding with a whaling vessel, this kind of thing, you know, um, outrageous life risking stunts that would get them into the newspaper. When I met and spoke to the founder of Greenpeace, made a long time to talk. I was standing at the bottom of the CN tower. So, you know, it's one of the highest buildings in the world. And the stunt Greenpeace were doing was that they climbed up the tower to hang a big flag saying their slogan on the tower. So life risking, and that, that barely got covered by the press. Nobody was interested in that case. It's actually a good counter example. You know, okay, you climbed up a tower and hung a banner. Okay, so that's what they have in common uh, with, with the type of social media activism we're, we're talking about today. I think everything else, though, is different. So Greenpeace's philosophy is not based on any notion that what they're doing is proven um, as a scientific truth to work through social science research. Uh, they are not claiming that if you read history, that the facts of history, that prior precedents of history prove that their method is effective. There's none of the verbiage of, like neither in philosophy, neither in principle nor in practice, um, there's none of the verbiage of the effective activism movement, right? So again, the effective activism movement, to my knowledge, got rolling in 2006, uh, and then it got bigger and bigger. Like 2012 was maybe its peak, I'd say. It's just from memory. It's something like that. Effective activism, they really proved that it was fundraising dynamite to say, hey, we have scientific facts. We have statistics that show if you donate a million dollars to us, and if you donate just $1,000 to us, here are the outcomes. Here are the effects. You know, guess what? Like, I can't even say 90% of the time it's a lie. I don't think I've ever seen a single inst instance where it wasn't a lie. So it's not just tempting to mislead the people who are donating to, you, donating to you, but this is really a pseudoscience rather than a science. So that was the big shift. The shift was the effective altruism movement. Sorry, if I said effective activism before, it's because both terms are used. But anyway, the effective altruism movement, the single most famous proponent of which is Peter Singer, but there were, there were many others. He wasn't the only voice and he wasn't the first voice. Peter Singer actually jumped on that bandwagon having already been on other bandwagons before, but he was a famous, prominent figure of that. And, um, uh, you know, so by the way, there were no outcomes. How was, I'm sorry, anyway, don't want to, I, I have made other videos critiquing it, but I mean, the, the, the fact is none of these ideologies work. You know, the protest movements don't work. The pro-democracy movements don't work. The Arab Spring doesn't work. They all end in disaster and failure again and again and again. What works is just the fundraising component. It's just the promise-making component. And that's what everyone's imitating and, and reacting to. Now, on the other hand, you could also make the argument that the, the Greenpeace element, pulling a crazy stunt and getting yourself into the newspapers, that that works and that that brings about some, some fundraising. And sure, that's part of what Direct Action Everywhere does. That's part of what... Uh, Roger Hallam uh, does. Sure, you know, th th this is uh, this is one factor. But yeah, th the issue of the, what I'm making, what I am presenting to you is the central issue. The myth, the myth that we know what's going to happen next. We know the future because of our analysis of history. That history proves there's only one way forward and this is it. Donate now, right? This is, you know, in Karl Popper's terms, historicism. It's exactly a repetition of the, the historicism that was criticized and debunked by Karl Popper. I don't want to digress into making this a, a video about Karl Popper's philosophy of falsification and so on. But, of course, it's not entirely a coincidence that they reinvented the wheel if the wheel you're talking about is the way Marxists would selectively interpret and misrepresent history to present their own cause as the one and only path to social progress, donate now, and um, to claim that they knew the future, that they had uncovered the pattern of history or something, or the laws of physics, if you like, and thus they could see the trajectory of history. They could see what was, what was going to happen next, and they knew the only strategy uh, that would work. Now, one of the differences is that Marxism is actually outrageous and very difficult to believe. The myth they're presenting you with is, is obviously incompatible with reality in so many different ways. So again, I don't want to make this into a video that's about Marxism. I don't want to make into a video that's about Karl Popper and uh, his philosophy of science and his critique of Marxism. It'd be too long a video. But to give a brief example, the Marxists claim 
with absolutely no sense of humor, I assure you, <laughs> um, the Marxists claim that the poor are constantly getting poorer under capitalism in countries like England, America, Germany. That's not true. Now, it's not true if you're looking at the period between 1880 and 1930. It's not true if you're looking at 1930 to 1960. And it's not true if you're looking at 1960 to 2020. This is a very simple elemental thing is that their idea is that with the progress of capitalism, the workers get paid less and less. They get oppressed more and more. And then they had this revolution. That didn't happen at none of the periods of time, like even during Karl Marx's life, that wasn't what was happening. That didn't happen. So uh, I'm just pointing out it's Marxism is an outrageous set of predictions about the future. It's an outrageous interpretation of history. What they say about the French Revolution is a lie. What they say about uh, the Paris Commune in 1848 is a lie. What they say about Napoleon III is a lie. Like everything they're saying about history is a lie. And then, of course, when you move forward, they lie even more. What they say about Lenin and Stalin is a lie. And what they say about Mao Zedong is a lie. But even the kind of foundational period, it's all lies about history. Okay, well, yeah, the new lies, the new mythology, right? At least right now, it's not so outrageous. People... The vast majority of people, they don't see that it's a myth at all. They can't see that they're being lied to or misled. And I've, I've talked to plenty of those people face-to-face, -face, people who really believe these are the facts of history established by social science research. Now, again, of course, it's passion over reason. Of course, it's an emotional rather than intellectual appeal. Don't you want to be like Mahatma Gandhi? Don't you want to be like Martin Luther King Jr.? Don't you want to be on the right side of history? Don't let yourself think about those other possibilities. You know, I started this video by saying boldly, where does democracy come from? These people want to believe that hippies dancing in the streets naked are where democracy comes from. They want to believe that topless protesters for women's rights or transsexual rights or whatever the, the cause of the day is, topless protesters against climate change, topless protesters against fur, that this kind of street activism, you know, again, proven by this very selective one-sided reading of history, proven by the kind of pseudoscientific quantitative research pioneered by the effective altruism movement, and I think effectively harnessed by people like Wayne Siong at DXE, people like Roger Hallam, they took that rhetoric and they took even those arguments and those peer-reviewed published papers. They didn't. They took the actual resources, the citations and the books and so on. And they presented that and they said, hey, here's the way politics works. Here's the way history works in the past and the present and in the future. You know, uh, uh, donate now. It's this very powerful mythology that's being presented to the world. And yes, fundamentally and integrally, it has to do with the question of where democracy co comes from, how democracy works now, how it will work and how it, how it should work in the future. I am going to wrap things up, babe. If you want to, if you want to jump in, <laughs> feel free to disagree with me. M Melissa and I talk for so many hours a day. Um, we spend a lot of time together, but you know, I'll, I'll go through the comments that are here. Um, I'll put a bow on it, but you know, I mean, it's funny because there are some things that <laughs> there's some things I've talked about on YouTube a hundred times. And it's interesting ever so often I reflect there are things that I've only ever talked about with Melissa, you know, but, but I mean, if anyone in the world was prepared for this spontaneous and unexpected YouTube video, I mean, it's you now because so, so many, well, Melissa's also read the book already. She read the first draft of the book. Uh, she found many typos in it too. But I mean, I just say it'd be it, uh, if uh, there's no pressure on you. But if you have anything to say, certainly nobody's better prepared. Nobody could be less surprised by this uh, live stream than you are now. So what I was thinking just now is one of the first the first video I ever saw on your channel was about this exact topic about protests yeah. and how protesting won't save the planet. And that appealed to me at the time because I had been a vegan for about two years and. Uh, I was starting to get more involved in vegan activism. I was, I was thinking about it. I was thinking if I really want to make a difference in the world, if I want more people to go vegan, you know, I've, I've tried my best to reach out to my family and none of them seem receptive. So I need to take this publicly. I need to do something, you know, this was, this was my thought process at the time. And then seeing your video made me rethink things. Right. And I was just like, 
thinking to myself, maybe I shouldn't do protests. Um, maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't get involved this way. And uh, I think what's so attractive about it is that you don't have to have any kind of expertise. You don't have to build up political. It's a good point. Sorry. Go on. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's a good point. I didn't mean. Go on. Yeah. It appeals to young people. I mean, this yeah. clip of Roger Hallam talking to a group of teenagers. You don't have to have the experience. You don't have to have some the resources that to offer uh, help to people or talent or yeah. intelligence. Yeah, sure. or a degree as a medical doctor where you can actually help people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah, something like Congress should have voiceless here, just standing there silent, holding up a. You know, yeah, this anybody thing. can do it. Yeah. 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 Right. So that's what's so appealing about yeah, it. Yeah, you're right. And you know, uh, also yelling on the street, it's something everybody can do. Just <laughs> Back and forth, and then, you know, yeah. you just repeat back what somebody else is saying, and uh, so in this way, well, yeah. Uh, sorry, so I do want to hear more if you have more to say, but yeah, I'm just yeah. going to jump in with a with a contrast. One of my longtime viewers, you know, someone who's a big fan of the channel, wrote to me in a simple question, but I took it seriously. It said, "Look, can you give me an example of someone who changed the world without any violence whatsoever?" So, but. It's not to say I'm someone who's completely opposed to the use of violence to change the world. All kinds of conflicts, the use of violence is inevitable. But it's a totally good question. Don't believe me. And I gave him several examples, but the main one was Walt Disney, the founder of the Walt Disney Company. Now, any of these political figures we talked about in this video, none of them have been as influential as Walt Disney. Walt Disney changed the world, and he still is. Like after the grave, you know, I think Walt Disney has been more influential than Karl Marx. In the last one hundred years, Walt Disney really is one of the most influential people in the history of the world. It takes talent. It takes hard work. Like even just learning to draw as well as Walt Disney. He personally did do illustrations and so on. He was also obviously a creative writer and came up with these plots and storylines. And I know it's mostly a butt of jokes, but there was a time when there was a huge conflict in America because all kinds of children turned to their father and said, how can you eat deer? How can you kill and eat a deer? Because they'd seen Bambi. It's a long time ago, and we mostly think of this as a joke. It's no joke. I mean, as bad as Walt Disney films may be, they raised fundamental ethical questions for generation. You may not know this, but Walt Disney was anti-clerical. He was anti-Christian and anti-religious, and that's why there are no Christian elements in any of the Walt Disney theme parks, Walt Disney Land, Walt Disney World, etc. And actually, the morality in the films made during his lifetime, you could say it's a kind of pagan morality but he, he intentionally and consciously rejected christian obviously for me personally i don't really look up to walt disney okay this is the point whether you think of a medical doctor who goes to myanmar and now starts to become an important and influential person in burmese politics because they're actually saving people's lives you know or you think of walt disney who begins with a blank sheet of paper and a pen drawing cartoons and then gets into movies and so on and so forth step by step there's a lot of hard work, a lot of talent, a lot of dedication, a lot of suffering, and a lot of potential for failure there. And Melissa has raised a very interesting point, which I, I don't think I've ever made in any of my videos. Like, I didn't make it today. I also admit <laughs> that, which is one of the things that's so fundamentally appealing about the protest-centered model and even this donation-seeking model, all these, these aspects of the model we've been talking about. But the currently dominant model of, of activism is that it doesn't demand talent from anyone. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, that's a good point. Uh, did, did you want to go further with that? Was anyone? Uh, yeah. I jumped in just to put a human face on it there, but yeah. But how much more intimidating to say to someone, Oh yeah, you want to change the world. You want to make a difference. Go to med school and become a surgeon. Do that first. Then we'll talk about making a difference. Say, Oh, Oh yeah. You want to want to become like Walt Disney become, you know, become, you know, well, that's intimidating. You know? Yeah. Right. I guess, I guess I could just expand more to say like this style of activism, uh, even going into a factory farm and taking one of the injured pigs or injured chickens, it not only brings you a sense of um, uh, friendship with other people that are participating in this, but you don't have to have any of the oratory skills that you would have to build up for this example yes. that you use at the start of the video, like Benjamin Franklin. Uh, the, the process of real political action, at least the old school style right. of either presenting information to a large group or going door to door, mm. uh, actually knocking on people's doors and handing out a pamphlet or something like that yes. is time consuming. You don't 
get the kind, the you, kind don't, of you don't get a lot of attention. You don't, uh, yeah, right. right. Uh, it's 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 a slow right. grind, and that's that's part of um, the short term thinking about protests, about getting involved in protests. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that just just yelling on the street, um, doing this simple thing once, will make changes that last for the rest of the world, you know, the rest of world history. Uh, this is the idea with Extinction Rebellion that's that's getting uh, uh, preached yeah. by Roger Hallam. Yeah, so. Um, anyway, thanks, baby. It was a good, uh, a good addition to the discussion of the video that I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see coming. Um, yeah, so all of our comments, there's a real emotional appeal to historicism that Karl Popper talks about at the end of his book, The Poverty of Historicism. So I just say, <laughs> not making this into a video about the philosophy of Karl Popper. However, one element of historicism is the sense of certainty people have in the future. Now, it, it wouldn't be fair to say that Marxists actually think they have like a magical vision of the future. But Marxists and many left-wingers, they believe they know, <laughs> in broad outline, they know what the future is and they're making progress toward it. And how they know that, what it is they think they know about it. Now, you know, again, if you actually talking to these people face-to-face, -face, what if we just use a culturally unfamiliar example? Okay, how certain are you in the future of Saudi Arabia? Is that, you know, you really think gay rights is coming for Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Now, in terms of my model presented in this video, I can tell you exactly how you'd get gay rights in Saudi Arabia. If Saudi Arabia is conquered by the United States of America, or if it's conquered by England or a consortium of European powers, if it is conquered, the power of the House of Saud is broken, you know, and it's, you know, okay, you know like uh, certain, certainly take a, a degree of sang-froid to think about how you could have gay rights in Saudi Arabia within the next 20 years or the next 50 years. It would come about through through force, right? And even through colonization, you could say, you know, that would be how gay rights would be accomplished in Saudi Arabia. But, you know, um, you know, so historicism, it's very, really, there are two aspects to it. One is, one aspect is that you know the meaning of history, right? Of course, there's all this mythology and self deception. Now, again, it's not just that you know the facts of history. You know the facts that matter. You know what to ignore in history, right? You know, so again, the way left-wing people remember the year 1848 or any of this other stuff, you know, the way they remember the French Revolution, uh, French revolutions, plural, I guess I should say. You know, the way, you know, they know not what happened, but what matters about what happened, what it really means and what it really foretells, right? And then the other side is the belief that you, that you know the future. Now, Many people, of course, say that this creates radicalism because they feel reassured that they're going to win. I have asserted in this video instead it creates passivity. It creates unspeakable passivity. Uh, the belief that progress is inevitable as opposed to living with the fear that, look, there's nothing inevitable about the culture in Texas becoming more and more like the culture in downtown New York City. You know, the opposite can happen. <laughs> The sort you know conservative Christian culture that we associate with Texas that can be the future of the United States of America, and there's no reason to assume that Saudi Arabia is going to become more and more like America. America can become more and more like Saudi Arabia when you really live. I mean, the type of uncertainty, the type of doubt I would encourage you to live with goes far beyond this. But living with doubt and uncertainty, even at that level, um, that inspires a certain kind of engagement inquiry, open-mindedness, and even political activism. Very different from the, the commitment to, to historicism. Um, so I have a question here that comes back to the original thesis of the video and what I proposed in my, my six-minute prologue or preview to this live stream. Nacho writes in, quote, Eisel, what did you mean by talking about the mythology created out of our personal lives and politics being in parallel? So I said that before the start of this, this live stream, and I'm, I'm going to say it again now. I was outlining for you at length the way in which one model of fundraising and one model of political activism basically favored someone like a Christian preacher. And many of the most successful political leaders, they were Christian preachers, you know. 
Now, this is not the only source of, uh, I don't know, bias that creeps into who gets to become a successful politician. Who was JFK? John Kennedy. He was the son of a multimillionaire. And that's it. He had no other preparation or qualifications. He had no interest in politics. He had no motivations. His early elections, he wasn't proposing any goals. There was nothing he wanted to accomplish. He, he was simply born incredibly rich. And this put it into politics. So, you know, the, the, the Christian preacher model is not the only model that has mattered historically and still uh, matters now. Being both a multimillionaire and a Christian preacher, yeah, I know you've really got advantages. But, you know, we talked about the type of character, the type of manipulation, and the type of dishonesty uh, that really centrally is about fundraising. You know, fundraising as the engine for political organization. You know, it's what makes everything possible in politics. Uh, sorry, I have all kinds of interests. I have all kinds of things I'd like to do. You know, I mentioned recently I would like to make a documentary film, could also be a book, talking about why are police in the United States of America so overweight and unhealthy? Now, that may sound shallow, but I don't want to make a shallow film or shallow book. I think it would be really interesting to move further with a kind of constructive critique of what's going on in American policing, to look at the lives that cops actually live. I'm not one of these defund the police people. I'm not an abolish the police people. To look at how miserable it is being a cop and to eat your lunch sitting in the front seat of your car every day and their struggles just to feed themselves and their struggles to be healthy and so on. Like what life is like for police and what the extent to which there are people who are falling apart physically and falling apart emotionally. And they feel despised and unappreciated by the society they're a part of. And another huge issue I'd be interested in there is um, police and their relationship to psychiatry. To what extent are police people who are relying on antidepressant drugs? You know, how they fit into the science and pseudoscience of the mind in our times. So, you know, get into the really, it's not a critique of policing or police officers, but a humanization of police officers. That includes the fact that, you know, despite the fact these men, they do put their lives in harm's way. There's a lot of professional pressure on them and social pressure on them to be lean and muscular. And they're not. I mean, the huge percentage of them, whenever I see the police on the news, the vast majority of them, they're falling apart physically. And I think many of them, I don't know how many, I think they're falling apart emotionally. And to question who the police are physically, emotionally, intellectually. What kind of, I mean, everyone said during 2020 that we should improve the education of the police. Well, what education do they have? Who are they? And how are they educated? The police that exist today to really inquire into that. I would love to do that as a project. Again, it could be a book. It could be a movie. It could be both. The research that goes in the movie, you spin off as a book, you know, put them on. I'd need money. I'd need support. I'd need donations from people like you to do it. Not a lot. It's not a lot of money. <laughs> I saw this ridiculous claim from Roger Hallam that he needed. Uh, well, anyway, they got more than one million pounds sterling, but he, the original target was eight hundred and fifty thousand British pounds. So let's call it one million dollars in round numbers, and they got over a million British pounds. They needed this for this one protest. Look at the protest. Where did the money go? What did you? What were you? Did you have solid gold placards? Did you get a you know gold-plated megaphone? What did you do with a million dollars for this protest? You know, so you just say to make that film or to do that research project, I wouldn't need a million of anything. But sure, you know, like your ability to do fundraising, and that is a kind of political protest. That is a kind of pro sorry, I shouldn't say word. That's a type of really legitimate democratic political activism. And I can present it both negatively and positively because I'm partly saying, hey, I'm trying to make the lives of police officers better. But, of course, it's partly going to be a critique of what's wrong with the policing system we have now. And, by the way, I mean, have you ever seen anyone getting into how much sleep police officers get, how many hours they work? I care about that even for pilots. You know, pilots who, who are expected to sleep on this terrible schedule, well, how safe is it to, for them to fly the plane? You know, uh, uh, but, I mean, you know, sleep deprivation for cops and the hours they work and, and all these other elements. I think that's tremendously meaningful. My ability to act on that idea there's a it completely relies on my ability to do fundraising right now 
by the way, contrast me to people who were successful. The guys who made the film Cowspiracy. They're not the only, so that was, I don't know if you guys know, that started a straight up crowdfunding. That was a straight up Kickstarter, you know, uh, donation drive. So they asked for donations. They say, hey, we have this idea for the film. And uh, compare, uh, compare, you know, what the promises they made at the beginning were to what the final film was like. You know, I, I think that's a kind of crappy film. It was successful. I'm happy for them because they're successful, but it's really kind of a crappy film. And again, I'm not willing to be dishonest, even to the extent to which the creators of Gauss are dishonest, neither in the fundraising nor in the filmmaking, nor nor anything else. Okay, so, so the question was bringing me back to something that was in the, the preview or promo video for this. What am I saying about the relationship between the mythology we make out of our personal lives and politics being in parallel, okay? So there's this young woman telling you, uh, she's not that young, actually. She's a middle-aged woman. Um, she's telling you that she doesn't lie to her audience. She doesn't lie. But uh, she only shows you the good parts of her life. <laughs> As you can see, she's emotionally cracking up. She's indicating that she can't do this anymore, can't do it at the moment. She's telling you how terrible. Okay, you know. It's so easy to talk about learning the lessons of history. But what we have right now is a political culture completely based on concealment and deception, where people like me come on camera and they talk about history, but they only show you the good parts. They only show you the facets of the story that support the propaganda case they're making. Sorry, this is flagrantly true with Wayne Siong and Roger Hallam and their quote unquote interpretation of history, their understanding of public protest, their understanding of democracy itself, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, simultaneously, they're constructing and conveying to you an image of who they are. Now, there are many parallels, these people. Durian Ryder boasted about how he went to jail. Wayne Siong boasted about how he went to jail. Roger Hallam, every lecture boasting about how he went to jail. Why is that? Right? There are other aspects to these people's lives, right? It's not like that's the only thing you did in your life. You're making a sort of selective, biased reading of your own personal history. You're doing it all the time on social media, right? So in parallel, we have, a, we have a generation of people who are growing up learning to present their political views as proven by the anecdotes of history, right? Proven by very careful, very prejudicial selection of anecdotes from history. And even those anecdotes may be built on a lie, may be built on active misrepresentations of what really happened or why it happened. Oh, hey guys, why did the Vietnam War end when it ended? Oh, hey guys, how did we abolish slavery again? So, you know, an anecdote that's told about the Vietnam War, an anecdote that's told about the abolition of slavery, an anecdote that's told about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it may already be a total lie and a total misrepresentation. But the careful selection of these anecdotes and then stringing them together with the wire to indicate a trajectory, to indicate the inevitable progress of history. At the same time, that's what people are doing in the examination of their own lives, in the exploitation of their own ongoing autobiography, whether that is to present themselves as a hero or as a victim, right? Fundamentally in this way, um, fundraising is leading us into a new and different era in which politics at every level is dominated by dishonest, self-promoting, self-centered fame hordes. And their short-term goals of becoming rich, becoming famous, becoming powerful, sex, fame, money, power, respect, their short-term goals are presented as if they're a necessary stepping stone to the long-term goals, as if they're prerequisite for those eventual outcomes. 
But my claim is consistently, again and again, the long-term outcomes never happen, never materialize. They're never even pursued. There's no progress made toward them whatsoever. I would say this about the left and the right. I think that the only lasting effect is the creation of the cult of personality for the individual doing the fundraising. How did Jordan Peterson become so rich and so powerful? He asked for donations so he could start his own university. That's what the donations were for. Look it up. You can find screenshots. It's unbelievable. It's mind-blowing. He began as someone offering a radical critique of what's wrong with the university system. There's a lot wrong with the university system, the United States and Canada. And that he was going to gather these donations. He poured out his heart. It was kind of chapter one of his famous period about everything that was wrong about these universities. And he was going to take your money and create a better and brighter university where he would obviously be a professor. And to some extent, he would be the president or what have you. And yet, mysteriously, that never happened. Okay? Whether it is PETA or Direct Action Everywhere or Greenpeace, none of them ever achieve their goals. None of them even move a single step closer to their goals. And my claim is Extinction Rebellion won't either. What's presented to you as a stepping stone, as a means to, the, to an end, the fundraising stage becomes simply an end in itself. You're reassured at the beginning that all this fame whoring, all this lying about the individual and their history, and all this lying about the world's history, the manufacturing and marketing of this myth, you're reassured that even if you can see some cracks in the facade, even if you could see something wrong with it, you're reassured that you should set that aside for the greater good of the goal you're moving towards, but the only thing that's ever accomplished is the wealth and fame of the one man or one woman who stands at the top of the organization and their wealth and fame and power will continue even if the organization itself withers away and fails once this process of fundraising is done.